it was a like a multi generational business, like a multi generational family business. Yes. Where, where did it all sort of start with with your granddad, obviously? Mm. So yeah, granddad, um, he became registered in 1930, I think, and um, yeah, it just went from there, sort of through the Second World War, and then dad, um, he ended up doing an apprenticeship, and then I think he had just finished his time and. Dad's uh, granddad handed him the keys and said, "See you in six months, son." And <laughs> he had no idea how to run a business, but yeah. um, he must have done an okay job and mm. came back. And yeah, Dad had some new car parked in the garage for him, <laughs> so yeah, he got to keep the job. Yeah, nice. And um, yeah. and then yeah, sort of, I didn't know what to do. I sort of tried to leave school in sixth form, so I could become a chef and oh, I'd yeah. burn water, right? But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But the idea was I could go surfing during the day and work at night. Nice. And, uh, yeah. And yeah, so mum and dad said, no, you're not leaving school. So I finished school and then, then didn't know what to do. And mm. so this pre-trade course came up. So yeah, did that and ended up doing an apprenticeship um, with a friend of dad's and uh, went from there. And so and my younger brother, Angus, so he's also other director of the company. He, um, yeah, he did his apprenticeship with dad and you know, he's in the South Island and mm. I'm in the North Island. So. So it's in the blood, eh? The old plumbing's in the blood by the sound of it. Yeah. And it started off in, in Christchurch. No, no. Oh, so it didn't? started in Auckland. Right. Yeah. Like, Dad lived in Auckland for the first 68 years of his life or something. And mm. must be something wrong with me because I'm the only one left in Auckland <laughs> now. And, um, yeah, Angus went pig hunting when he was 21 and never came back. And, yeah, so, no, it's, yeah, it's just me left there as far as family goes. Yeah, yeah. And it's always been Macmillan Plumbing? It's always been the family, family name there? Um, yeah, so it's been different um, incarnations of it, I suppose. Mm. Like, uh, Granddad actually bought he bought and he bought the business off this guy called Charlie Mountain um, for like five thousand pounds or something back in the day. But mm. apparently, this guy Charlie Mountain he won the Scottish Lottery twice in two weeks or something. Sounds oh, a bit yeah. dodgy, eh? So. Um, <laughs> And so yeah, so Granddad bought the business for five thousand pound, but it's like ten thousand pound in debt or something. Right, so, right. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's always been what we've known. You know, you've seen mm. Dad, mm. you know, take off to work first thing in the morning, and yeah, just sort of I guess it wasn't really anything else to do. So yeah, carried on. Yeah. Um, the the thing you said before about running a business like that's always intrigued me because I guess the few few of the people we've been talking to about. On this, on on the old podcast, are mainly business owners, mm. and that's been quite interesting. Like talking to people from the point of view that they kind of just start doing what they do, and then it kind of organically just grows. Um, and that tends to be like the kind of the Kiwi way, I guess. Say, eh? like no one really. Well, there are businesses that start quite, you know, they, they're big, but every business starts quite small. And usually, you know, same story with us. We started off with just me and Kylie, and that is that is that kind of how. You know your your family business started was it just literally your granddad doing something and then it just organically grew yeah yeah totally um like you hear stories you know it's, i guess it's sort of been in the 40s or 50s but you know this is before they all had their own plumbing vehicles and stuff and they'd you know put a toilet pan on the tram and head down parnell rise or they'd go to a street and then the word would get out that there's a plumber in the street yeah and um and they could be there for weeks like sometimes job cards would come in and it'd be plucking ducks you know for, <laughs> for some old widow or something that um yeah needed, needed the job done so yeah. yeah and it's just always growing and i think you know personally yeah whenever i open my mouth dumb shit falls out <laughs> you know i'm horrendous at saying no to people yeah. uh, to the point where i'm not allowed to talk to some people because i keep saying yes <laughs> but um yeah, but yeah it, it's all been organic you know the mm. um yeah just we you know say so on the maintenance side you know we that GFC is what really kicked off the maintenance side. Dad was always a commercial plumber, mm. and um, you know he sort of rode the waves of that commercial market when times were great. You know, made a shitload of money when mm. when times were tough. You know, mm. thing, things were really hard. So, I think it was that GFC that prompted me to go. Well, this is pretty rubbish. You know, when um, you know we won a, I think we there's a job up in Silverdale, and we won the job, and then. The guy, the main contract said, "Oh, I've got a price that's ten percent cheaper," and so we matched it because we had no work. And oh, yeah. and then and then he's like, "Yep, cool, you got the job." And then like five days later, "Oh yeah, sorry, we've got another ten percent cheaper price." Oh, yeah. And you know we had twelve guys sitting around or whatever, so mm. we sort of sucked it up and 
and doing so is probably the best investment actually getting my ass kicked on that job mm. because it pushed us into a different direction and so I think it's um, yeah I've sort of ended up down in Brudermart there you know when it was the old train station yeah. uh, bus station and everything mm. and um, yeah I remember walking through some of those abandoned buildings that are pretty flash now and you know literally knee deep in pigeon shit yeah. and um, all the all the windows are boarded up and walking through one room where you can hardly see anything and then all of a sudden this homeless dude just pops up <laughs> you know from under these cardboard boxes <laughs> that made me shit myself but um <laughs> But yeah, so like that started there, and so that whole organic growth, mm. you know, like we didn't have a website for 18 years. And, um, <laughs> Classic. Yeah, and so yeah. basically all of our success in Auckland, as far as client side goes, is just from word of mouth. Mm. You mm. know, like you know, someone from Britomart moved to Colliers, or you know, they moved on somewhere else, and mm. X Y Z, and yeah, like. It's, it's quite a cool story, really, when you look back on it. Yeah, I, I, and I'm glad you got a website because I was reading that that story before, and it's um it's bloody good. Like it is, it, it resonates really well with well, I think from our point of view as a business owner, but I think it, it should resonate with a lot of Kiwis as well because it is quite a Kiwi story. And you know, you talk we were saying about um, the organic growth in that, um, so you know, it proves that someone that's a plumber isn't just a plumber; they're a bloody business owner. They can grow a business, they can keep a business running. Just like a lot of a lot of trades, I reckon, eh? like they, you know, they they're not just a Sparky or a plumber or a builder. Like they have to get, they have to learn the business side of things. Yeah, mm, yeah. I think it's very much someone's personality. Like what I've worked out over twenty years of you know doubting myself or am I you know being a wimp here or should I be standing up here or mm. just your personality tends to work out whether you're successful or not mm. you know like i just love helping people to yeah. the point where it annoys the shit out of our staff you know <laughs> and you know like like i'm i see myself as like one percent of the equation you know like the team that we've got are just so awesome you know and, and yeah they they just take care of everything you know mm. on this on the um maintenance side you got Sinead who's just a little weapon and you know rallies the troops and then you got all the guys you know like just looking at um our teams chats and stuff like that you know being in this commercial sector it's definitely not a seven to four job mm. you know you it's 24 know, 7 eh? you know all about that mm. and so you know we've got about 17 guys or 18 guys on the on call roster and i don't know i think i was just counting up today there's 60 or 70 buildings in the city we sort of wow. have on call yep you know and so yeah like you know wouldn't be anywhere near as successful as we are if it wasn't for that team you know and mm. so I, I think that's just the way the way you treat people and it's the way you naturally treat people you know yeah. like someone knows if you're bullshitting someone and trying to you know give them a pat on the bum mm. when you don't really mean it mm. you know and, and i think that's what it is is people can see through you and so as long as you treat people with respect and dignity and yeah i think everything else sort of takes care of itself yeah well, like you say the the honesty like kind of resonates with people like you can tell people that are just in it just they smile you know on cue and all that sort of thing it's like no no people can see through that yeah, yeah. and it's, um yeah they don't stay in business for very long or if they do they move around a lot oh so you aren't actually answered my question about the team thing i was going to say how's your like how many on your team how are you guys actually structured like how do you guys manage your your, your team of uh, plumbers here because you said you got 80 something net, like throughout the whole country mm. just in auckland um 17 odd but oh uh, yeah structure. so well, there's a few different sides to our business, and mm. I think that's another reason, another thing that helps us, you know, is that diversity. Mm. So, um, like I say, say in Auckland, we've got commercial and maintenance, and say out of commercial, you've got the commercial team, plus we call it small contracts, which does a lot of our office fit out stuff, you know, that we're incumbents in some of these big buildings we're in. Mm. Um, and then we've got the maintenance side, which Predominantly, we only really do commercial maintenance. We just don't have the, the time to um, to look after Mrs. Smith. Yeah. You know, we, we'd love to, but we, mm. we just don't. So, so yeah, so I've, I've got, you know, I'm real lucky. I've got a bunch of key people that look after different things. Um, you know, I see I've got Sinead, she manages the, the maintenance guys, and then I've got George who looks after our commercial side, and I've got Dinesh who helps with our QE scene, Sarah who helps with all the financial account stuff and mm. so I'm I'm really lucky like um, yeah actually uh, yeah 
I won't go into that. <laughs> we can edit bits and pieces. Yeah, yeah, sweet it is. All right, yeah. now that's cool. Um, so yeah, so like I'm real lucky. I've got key people in key places, and I think mm. that's another part of the secret. If you try to do everything yourself, you're going to put yourself in a box. Yeah, bloody and, right. and yeah. you're going to do a shit job. Mm. Like, mm. like I'm, I'm really good with people, but. I'm pretty average at following up on some things, and so that's why I need those key people to help me. Yeah, you know. So well, that's why you employ them, mate. Like you don't employ them to give yourself more work. Um, you mm. know, often at times, I guess you might you might have found this too throughout your your business career is that you end up, you know, you bring someone on board and you find yourself working harder, and you're like, hang on, the old tail's wagging the dog a bit here. Mm. And you got to be quite aware of that, I guess, and you know, even in your in your industry as well. Yeah, like I'm I'm an expert at that. Like if there's <laughs> An Olympics for bottlenecks. I'd probably get gold, <laughs> silver, and bronze because I just want to help people. Yeah. And um, generally, things go better without me. Mm. Like, I actually got diagnosed with bowel cancer in the last year. Holy shit! And, um, really? So, yes, yeah, so that was a bit of a shock. But um, yes, yeah, oh, yeah. so I spent Christmas Day in hospital um, after surgery, and I was convinced I was just going to have that, and then I'll be sweet and you know have a slow summer, go surf, you know, that sort of fun stuff. Yeah. But yeah, no, that didn't happen, and so then I'd just been through six months of chemo, and um, yeah, now mate, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> and, didn't the, know this. and the funniest yeah. thing of all of it is that <clears throat> business actually went better without me. So I'm having a bit of a, a bit of a personality crisis <laughs> at the moment, yeah. and so I got, I've seen there's two ways: either I've done a really great job training everyone, mm, mm. or else I'm just a yeah a perfect bottleneck where yeah. I keep help, helping people, but. Yeah, and it's it's proved time and time again since I've been away that if you empower other people, um, they often do a way better job than you. So, well, mate, shit, that's taken me a bit by surprise actually. Um, so fucking the old bowel cancer, shit, that must yeah. have been a um a bit of a shock. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I had a bit of a, a fail last March, and um, that I think pretty sure they misdiagnosed it then. Oh. So then sort of felt pretty shitty all through the year and then come December it's just still felt felt like crap mm. so um so yeah went back and got a second opinion basically and another colonoscopy there but they're quite fun aren't they yeah <laughs> looking forward to another one of those <laughs> um and yeah it was a completely different story so I wow. went 15th of December and six days later I was in Auckland Hospital getting it chopped out and uh yeah so yeah. made some new mates for Christmas and yeah yeah, so so it mm. must have been a hell of a just a wake up call in life, though I guess. Yeah, yeah, it was. <coughs> Look, I've never really drank coffee, mm. but I was sort of that guy who drank four energy drinks a day. Oh yeah. And so I don't think that's really that conducive to, yeah. to healthy living. And so. Well, your teeth are in pretty good, Nick. Like, yeah, your old teeth yeah. usually take a hammering with the energy that, drinks. That was another. Oh, I actually won a hundred dollar bet when I was twenty one because I made a bet with Dad when I was about ten that I wouldn't have a filling before I was twenty one. Yeah. Yeah, he came through on my on my twenty first and gave me a hundred bucks. So <laughs> good stuff. Yeah, that was a bit of a win, <laughs> but um, yeah. So yeah, I guess all I'd say of that is mm. you, you're not invincible. You're not Superman. You know, like yeah, I used to work a lot more than I do now. You know, seventy, eighty hour weeks and Shit. do on call. You know, shutdowns and stuff like that. Mm. But I know as you get older and grayer and fatter and yep. stuff like that, you know, yep. you don't need to. Eh? It's all happening. Yeah, yeah so. it's happening right now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, so that, oh shit, that's um, yeah, and you've fully recovered. Um, don't know. Uh, yes, yeah, no, I'm good. Mm. I'm good. Like the markers and stuff are good, but you just fall into um, you fall into the care of the surgeon for five years, mm. and then you got to have blood tests three or four times a year, and you know CT scans and some mm. more of those awesome colonoscopies. So yeah, but still way better than the alternative. Well, that's right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so it's definitely a wake up call, and you know you gotta enjoy every moment with your family and whatnot. Mm. And mm. You know you're you obviously you're a crook for you know a pretty significant amount of time, really, and but you found that your team you know stepped up and and bloody you know took the reins and and kept the business running and mm. you know kept it going good. Yeah, and look, I think that stems back to how you treat people. You mm. know, like. You know, like everyone in our office, they genuinely care about each other. You know, like mm. you know what it's like sometimes in your business. You have people come in and they just completely upset the the culture of the mm. business, and you know it starts riling up a few other people, and mm. you start having problems you didn't have before, and then they disappear, and um, and it all goes back to normal. 
it's quite often you end up employing people for the wrong reasons like you end up employing them out of say desperation Mm. because you're like shit i need to get someone in here to fill the spot and that's when that's when you make the decisions that aren't lining up with you know how you normally hire someone you know or the you know they don't sort of fit with your with your values or whatever for the team and that's i've found over the years that that's when the 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 cock-ups happen yeah would that be similar for you guys yeah Mm. yeah like yeah like some of our best people are are people that you weren't actually looking for you know Mm. like um or people that come through people so like like say george you know he's married to um a lady called Nat who used to be our general manager you know and then Sinead she came in for like a two week temp stint um, because the whole family was down in the South Island so my brother and my sister got married a week apart from each other so not we're to in the other. South not to each yeah. other no not that close <laughs> um, but um, yeah. yeah so so then the receptionist ran away with 400 bucks or something and so one of our plumbers at the time um called Howard said oh, I've got a niece and so for the first two weeks I thought her name was actually Anissa Howard and that's like no nah, she's a niece of Howard so her name's Sinead and so yeah look sometimes you know the best people come from the least likely places you know mm, mm. So. have you have you had much issue sort of finding um, staff over this COVID period because I guess all the talk in the media is about the great resignation and you know people moving jobs and stuff and mm. that is pretty pretty real out there have you guys found that with with, with trying to look for staff no touch touch wood we've, we've been pretty good mm. um you know i've just threatened to kill people if they leave so it's quite <laughs> easy <you know>? um <laughs> yeah so we've got a few packs going on in the office here of, of mass suicide if people leave so um <laughs> that tends to work really well yeah, it's good but yeah. um no look I, I guess it comes down to that culture again you know mm. and and how you treat people and you know you've, you've got to look at paying people you know good money mm. and and i think you know look at giving pay rises before they're asked yeah you know um and so yeah i think our key people are, are looked after mm. and but it comes down to more than money it's the way they're treated you know how flexible can you be you know if you've got sick children can you work from home mm. you know have you got appointments and you know look the last six months these guys have proven time and time again that they do a way better job than me so mm. Mm. my sort of logic is you know if you can do a great job you know you should have that flexibility to yeah. to do what you need to do as well so yeah, yeah. no and that's, that's become hugely more like an important to people throughout COVID right because they everyone had that disrupted period of a couple of years where they had to adapt their working methods and stuff like that and I guess no doubt you guys would have been a, an essential service um, through that period yeah, yeah there's yeah. A, a lot of essential servicing happening uh, <coughs> during that lockdown yeah yeah, my wife got sick of that call after about the second day eh, when yeah. I said, you, you need an essential service, love? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I thought it was hilarious, so I still do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and look, during that, that first, that lockdown stuff, we still only, you know, work, you know, our work dropped off by 90%, you know, like, mm. we weren't flouting those laws of running around just changing tap washers because we could, you know. Yeah. And so, and probably because we didn't do all of that residential stuff either, mm. all of our buildings and town people, you know, they went there. Mm. So it's hard for them to break things when they're not there. Yeah, true. And so, so yeah, so definitely, mm. definitely slowed down for sure. Mm. And back back onto the staffing aspect about it, like, how do you, how do people get into the the plumbing industry? Um, you know, from the point of view, let's say they, they leave high school, or do you, do you actually find many people? coming through like that way or do people have a career change part way through their life and decide to become a plumber or how, how yeah. does it work with your apprentice stuff yeah like there's probably two ways like one's that that straight out of school um and then the other one is that whole change of vocation you know mm. like we actually often advertise for adult apprentices mm. you know because you get someone who i know say 29 32 you know that they've got drive in them they've mm. got life skills you know they might have a child or a wife or a mortgage and so they haven't got time to to muck around you know and um you know 18 year olds can be great but they've also just met alcohol <laughs> and they found what what the other sex does to them that's right and uh and so they're more interested in it in you know friday to sunday than monday to, to friday mm. so um yeah so there's two ways of going we're really keen on adult apprentices um just for that whole they just get in there and mm. you know a year later they can actually be really really useful and really valuable mm. 
What's the um what's the process that people go through from say going shit I want to I'm going to be a plumber like do they have to do you have to do like a training qualification or do you just straight away just come and join a company like yours and start being an apprentice? Yes, yeah, so like you can you can do a pre trade course mm. and so that's like oh, I couldn't tell how many weeks maybe six to nine months of three days a week mm. and you learn the the basic fundamentals of plumbing mm. or else you can just dive in and and get straight into it so. Yeah, it's like a, f- a five-year um, apprenticeship to do plumbing, gas, and drain lane. Yeah. And so, how come those three go all hand in hand? Like, because it's always like plumber and gas fitter is always the thing. You don't just see gas fitters really by themselves. Yeah, um, gas fitting isn't as common as in like mm. in Europe and UK and stuff oh, like that. Yeah. So yeah. you'd be surprised. There is a number of people that do just gas fitting, mm. but I don't think compared to plumbing like there's probably out of 100 percent 90 percent of all work is is plumbing Mm. yeah and then the 10 percent is gas Mm. but then if you're not doing gas the whole time a lot of people shy away from it Mm. so they they drop off their gas fitting qualifications and you know and just stick to plumbing so the the whole industry is getting watered down to be fair yeah you know people are doing less and less like i think 100 years ago we used to install glass plumbers used to be glaziers as well And, you know, and then the roofing and you know looks i'm sure there's a bunch of plumbers still do roofing but mm. now with health and safety and you know you can't get up on a roof when it's raining now mm. so it's hard to find the leak and yeah and then you know you've got six hours on a job trying to find a leak and then it rains from the wind comes from a different direction and the the leak reappears and mm. so yeah we're just trying to stick to our knitting and you know we can't be everything to everyone mm. at all times so that's quite a, a, a good moment of realization eh? when you when you sort of go we're just going to stick to what we're good at we're not going to try and add on bits and pieces or you know do do things poorly that we're not quite good at helps the whole business just focus i guess a lot more yeah for sure mm. i remember you you came and had a chat to our team a couple of years ago over at, when we we're at the old office mm. and um i remember you saying back then that you you got a number of buildings in the city and I was quite sort of fascinated by that I remember you saying that you really like the the big buildings you know like the big towers or the yeah. big, really big well-known ones um is that still the case down, down the yeah city? it's just a different type of plumbing also mm. you know you can drive over the harbour bridge or you can be you know out for dinner or something and you just look up at the skyline and you know you know you've got something mm. to do with all these buildings and you're helping the basically safety of the nation you know yeah Plumbers very important people. You mm, know, mm. If you don't drink water, you'll die. <laughs> exactly. You <know? laughs> and if your shit can't be flushed away yeah. somewhere else, oh, exactly. Yeah. Like, I think it was only in the seventies. I think that we actually got taken out of the same bracket as doctors and surgeons and stuff. Like we used to be that important, eh? <laughs> so it's just going down and down and down now. Yeah. But um, yeah, look, it's just saying it's quite cool, and also it's it is different. You know, like shit, ninety percent of plumbers wouldn't know their way around a big building. You know. Mm. And, not saying that we're amazing it's just that we've had the time to to learn that you know with you know pumps and pressure reducing stations and mm. you know just different things that happen for different reasons i remember one time at a, a building that will rema- remain nameless yeah. um walked in then there's like someone had like a foam party there was like this much foam on on the ground floor bathroom it's like, how, like coming out of the toilets out of the floor waste and, and it turns out it was the end of the month and the cleaners got, had got their new batch of cleaning product in so they proceeded just to tip all the old stuff down the drains and you know, it reacted with all of the you know the hot water and stuff and yeah. just blew up basically and it backflowed and came up through the yeah. drains and stuff. yeah just blew out everywhere so so yeah so it's just different and and for me it's that that job satisfaction like there's been yeah. numbers of jobs over the years um y- you know that it becomes quite stressful you know like certain things i remember we had the um the train station closed down at like 10 to 5 on a Friday night or something mm. because the water had blown on level two and yeah we just couldn't get to the isolation valves and yeah so pretty precious stuff you know you got other things buildings that have got no water and you can't work it out and we we found like a, a rag that it must have gone in in the water main somewhere and come into the water meter at the start of the building and so you know like when um, these big buildings haven't got water it, there's a lot of people yelling in a lot of directions you know well, man, the, the amount of damage that water can do when it's not in the right place, you know, so if it's, um, if it should be going down a pipe or down a drain or whatever, um, but when there's a, a leak in a pipe or something gives way, man, water is probably, I reckon it's worse than fire in a lot of ways, because, you know, when you have a fire, like a sprinkler activation, um, 
the, the water the, the sprinkles will activate and put the fire out but then you've still got the water just pouring out for however long it takes mm. for the fire to get there so it's it's really um, like destructive stuff eh? you must have seen a few horrific bloody yeah. floods over the years yeah there, there was one um, not that long ago actually in a building that we didn't do um, out in Manukau but it um, it had lasted for about a year and this, this copper like the, the copper crimp system is relatively new mm. And some of it's pretty good stuff that you don't actually have to crimp it and it holds for oh, a long yeah. period of time. And so yeah. there was this pipe at the end of a long corridor and it had lasted for a year and a half and just decided to give way on, on you know, level eight or something. Mm. And um, yeah, so from there all the way down, it was just, just water everywhere, you yeah. know, ceilings, yeah, it was horrendous. So. Yeah, and then the, the clean up and the, you know, the cost to remediate a, a flood especially when it cascades down multiple stories is horrific yeah. you know, we've dealt with loads of those over the years and the insurance guys are just going well another one you know, yeah another in the you know it's just creates such a bloody hassle and mess and you've got to make sure that all that stuff is dried out really well as as well you know like you can't just leave something damp because then the mold comes that's in like mold eh? it's yeah just that's as horrific that's, yeah do you mm. see much of that from a like do you guys get involved with the like the remediation side of no, things or, yeah. no I, I saw it. I saw on one of our lists today, actually, one of our contacts for after hours is the crime scene cleaners. Oh, yeah. So I thought, oh, that's a bit dramatic. You know, yeah. it's just water. There's no, like, blood or mm. any other bodily parts hanging around. But <laughs> they're obviously pretty good at cleaning up areas that are pretty wasted. They do a good job, those guys. Like, I've got a, they've done some work in a building recently down in the city. But, man, they do, they're worth their weight in gold, eh? Mm. Got to get them in for a chat, actually, too, because they're, They've got some pretty interesting stories around some of the messes they have to clean up, and I think floods are usually the nicer things that they tend to deal yeah. with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, what's the like when you when you're dealing with a nice big building? What's the main difference between, um, say, the plumbing in a in a huge high rise as opposed to just your your bog standard plumbing at, at home in your yeah. house? Usually, there's <coughs> some big pump set at the bottom, and quite often that will pump to heater tanks on the roof that could be. 25, 35, 50,000 litres and then that gravity feeds down through the building except for the first few floors which is pumped mm. um, so you got that like the actual plumbing say inside a bathroom mm. is pretty similar but then, you, then you've got different things like you can't just let the water go from the top floor, let's say it's 40 storeys down to the bottom floor because mm. the head will you know, fall, will be way too high yep. and so you got to almost break it with say pressure reducing stations um you've then got your different waste systems and you know we're just starting to see now in a, in a bunch of buildings the copper copper stacks mm. are starting to give way right usually from the urine and, and the cleaning acids mm. and so that's that's um can be quite a major to fix because it's mm. usually right just above the the floor level right and so you've got to go to the floor below and is that in a certain age of building like have they been installed within a certain like time frame yeah, or lifespan yeah probably from 1990 and before yeah you know, sort of after that a lot of it has moved to um pvc mm. and that's you know because it's just plastic it's not as um suitable for corrosion did you ever come across that stuff back in the 90s um called duck's quest that black yeah and it was a it was like a rolled pipe and it had a seam down it yeah and that stuff ended up giving way and causing shitloads of problems yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's more residential, but yeah, I don't, mm. I don't think they can. It's uninsurable now, eh? Mm, mm. So yeah, it's pretty horrendous. And look, there's a couple of other systems out there that are, are, are starting to fail, but a lot of it sort of comes down to I think the installation ninety percent of the time. That's what we <coughs> we were told that by um, we had the guys from um, Fusiotherm come in and have a chat to us mm. because they they found that their product was getting a real bad rap, mm. um, and because you got oh, that bloody green piping again. Mm. But the, they reckon 99% and 95% of the time, it was the way that it was installed. It wasn't installed correctly. Yeah, oh, totally. Like, mm. and, you know, even full disclosure, the first job we did, um, you know, 12 years later, failed. And, mm. you know, being plumbers, you know, you know, know everything, you know. And, and they had the, their, their special green clips, which was four or five times the price of the normal black clip. And, right. you know, being the most knowledgeable, best looking trade in, in the industry, you know, we'd <laughs> know better. And so, yeah, and so. I mm. should listen to them a bit more, but um, mm. but yeah, it's just the installation. But then, like today, everything's crimped these days, you know. And that's still got a rubber O ring in it, mm. you know. Mm. You do wonder if if that's going to be an issue in 
another 20 years you know what i mean mm. but then people should be doing like regular maintenance and stuff eh? do you guys offer like regular maintenance of plumbing yep. systems and yeah, stuff? yeah for sure so we do um plan preventive maintenance across i don't know dozens of buildings in the city mm. and it's just trying to capture stuff and you know y- you usually actually end up spending the same amount of money mm. but you don't have any fuck me moments yeah you know like yeah. the the pumps get serviced so you don't run out of water and have to race someone in to put a new pump in mm. or you know you, you see a valve is starting to corrode so you get it replaced you know what i mean mm. and also it's just little things like making sure the valves actually turn off because otherwise if you have a, a major and it's the valve hasn't been turned off in 15 years mm. you know especially on the hot water you know it's just horrendous so so yeah it's um you know a lot of the the bigger companies that have that that budget for that sort of stuff you know it generally works really well mm. that's a good point about preventative maintenance and when you actually spend your money because people think that you're well you are essentially just trying to you, you won't be spending any less but you're just trying to stop the inevitable happening when, which could probably be like a flood or a bloody something that's going to cost you a lot more money totally. so you just kind of yeah, you're trying to avoid that really aren't you mm. yeah it's just like it's just like servicing your car mm. You know, you don't go and drive your car for 100,000 k's and then surprise when the mm. engine falls out. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I guess it's that logic and, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So just thinking about, like, how the how plumbing fits into the trade landscape, because whenever we talk about tradies, we always talk about, you know, sparkies, plumbers and builders. Mm. Um, how do you guys... Is there much interaction between those three trades from your point of view? So like even from a say a new build perspective or a commercial perspective or just, you know, um, trades in general? Yeah, no, look we're all you know, we're all a pretty tight bunch. We all give each other a lot of shit. Mm. You know, naturally plumbers are at the top of the pole. You know, don't probably actually need to say that out loud, do I? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, and no how do I, how do I say it? Yeah, we just all work in with each other, really. Mm. And even within that, you sort of get in your own niches. Mm. Like, you know, we only work for two or three construction companies in Auckland, you know, because that whole, you know, sometimes your face just doesn't fit mm. with other people. And if you're working with the same crowd, you know who they are, you know how their jobs run. You know, you, you haven't won a job because they used your price because it was the cheapest. And, mm. and look, if you're the cheapest, you probably missed something. And... And then it just becomes a, a big game of cat and mouse, you know. Like, like we actually do a lot of design and build stuff ourselves. So we've got our own in-house engineering team. Um, we do early contractor involvement. So you know, you'll give us a set of architectural plans, and we'll say, "Hey, this care home's a million million bucks, mm. you know, based on these last five jobs." Um, and they go, "Okay, that's that's in our budget, or that's a bit high, or." But then we can do the design for it, work through it, and then we actually do the construction job this builder has a has a price with no variations right because if i go oh, hey brady cover a couple of thousand dollars for a backflow i forgot to put on the drawings <laughs> sure yeah hey, hey no worries right. fully boots yeah <laughs> um so it actually protects him more than us mm. but that that helps me like, i hate confrontation yeah. you know like a lot of people will price plumbing drawings from plumbing consultants and know that something has to go there but it's not on the drawing so they don't allow for it where I was, I would allow for it, but my price might be 10% out. Mm. And it's like, oh yeah, but I allow for that. But then the other guy gets it because he's cheaper. And on day one, he comes in with a stack of variations. variations. You'll need this, 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 and this. Mm. And so, so yeah, so by us doing the the budget, then the design, then the construction, um, it's the safest way for that main contractor not to have any escalation costs. So it just de-risks it for them. Mm. And, um, and then we can go and maintain the building for its life cycle and then we actually know where everything is as well mm. and i guess because it's a family business you know there'll always be me or angus here you know you're not a a bigger company that has managers you know like say you work for someone and you are in charge of that area then next year you thought oh, i'm going to go work for someone else mm. all your knowledge with that building's left yep. and so you know, as long as me and angus are around there'll always be someone that can pick our brains yeah exactly and so yeah. so that works well so i guess doubling back on your whole thing with that interaction is yeah you just end up working with like-minded people mm. you know like i'm sure there's some yeah yeah so no it's just really good any um truth to the rumor that plumbers tend to own the most boats oh. 
this one doesn't <laughs> you know I did um have a bit of a fold and bought a, a jet ski side unseen the day before my bowel surgery oh. <laughs> Uh, terrible timing. Yeah, I'd taken the family to um, where to, uh, it, was, it must have been like the 18th of December, I guess. So the week before Christmas, so I took the family and kids to dress mart, you know, in case something didn't go yeah. well in the surgery. Said, yeah. right, let's go fill your boots, here's yeah. some money. And, um, and then I remember Emma was trying on some jeans, and me and Callum were sitting outside on um, on the trade me outside her, the changing room, just sniggering each time we. Because it became one of those dick measuring contests after a while, right? And and it like fed, uh, yeah, hand on heart. The last bit I did was like, no, that's too much. I mm. can't spend that much mm. money without even seeing it. Yeah. But it turns out the guy that sold it to me was an absolute weapon, eh? And, no, um, good. Yeah. Still got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only got it last Christmas. Mm. But the only reason he sold it is that a mate of his had actually also bought the same Jixi like three months after him. Oh, right. And he got real fucked off, so he just wanted a new one. <laughs> The bigger one. <laughs> no, it was exactly the same yeah, one, but the same one. the same model. Right. And um, but yeah, no, I've never met the guy, but he called me up like five or six weeks after my surgery and said, "Hey, mate, just want to see how you're doing." Mm. And, oh, that's nice. Yeah, good humans out there. Yeah, so. that's um, yeah, shit, that's that's bloody good. It repays your faith in humanity, but hey, when people like that don't even know you, um, can can give you a call like that, and um, yeah, that's yeah. bloody good. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, as far as the boats go, maybe one day. Mm. Um, it's quite good though. Well, I don't know if it's good or not. Me and Angus have got this dynamic that we're polar opposites. You mm. know, like if it was me, I'd I'd be bankrupt in two years, but I'd have that big boat <laughs> and like you know diggers and shit I don't need. And yeah. and if it was Angus, he'd have like three plumbers and do everything himself. You know, so right. together we we are really good. That Pretty good team, I, yeah. I, I push him forward and he he holds me back a bit. Mm. So yeah. yin and yang type thing. Yeah, yeah. So no, I wouldn't want to do it with anyone else. And um. Yeah, so that's really cool. That's cool, man. Yeah. And how do you find, like, working with family? Like, I guess you've been used to it and you've grown up around it, but, you know, some people say, I'd never work with your bloody family. It gets contentious or whatever, but you guys mm. have got a, got a pretty good good relationship. Yeah, well, <coughs> I guess it's good that you can never get fired. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit of a win, eh? Yeah. I don't know what my CV would look like <laughs> if I had to put it out there, eh? Um, but, no, look, yeah, look, it's good. It's hard as well, though. Mm. You know, it is hard. Um you know, mum and dad, they retired, like, literally, I think the day COVID started. Mm. And so that sort of stuffed up their their retirement plans a bit. Um, but, yeah, no, look, I, I recommend it. You, you've got the same, yeah, you, how do you say it? Because you're family, you're all on the same page, mm. you know. Mm. Definitely tried to resign a couple of times when I was younger. Yeah. Um, but... But yeah, no, all in all, it's pretty good. You know, yeah. you've got a family business. Yeah. You know, like if your kids came into it, I'm sure you probably wouldn't listen to them. No, not yeah, at all. Dad no. definitely didn't listen to me. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I, I got over it after a while because I stopped listening to him as well. So it's quite good. <laughs> when I met um, when I met Emma, um, I was 20 or something, and she had just started working here in New Zealand, mm. and um, it was real. It was like within three weeks, I got the perfect timing because she had to choose her her partner. Yeah, one person that could fly for for cheap, mm. and so I think that first year I, I think I was away for sixteen weeks or something. <laughs> and so after about the third time that um, I asked Dad if I could have like four days off to go to Aussie or something, and he said no, I just yeah. stopped asking him. Don't come back. And so yeah, yeah. so it worked out quite well actually. Yeah. But, um, it's yeah. a good perk. No, families are good. Yeah, mm. it's a good perk. Mm. Yeah, Air New Zealand thing, far out. Yeah. Anyone that works in the airlines, eh? I wonder if it still happens. I don't know. Yeah, I think it still it does. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I think they had the. They may have put a limit on it though, mm. given that they're all trying to recover from, uh, you know, COVID times, isn't it? It's been pretty horrendous, eh? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, the flights. They, like, I think I tried to book a flight to Wellington the other day for four hundred dollars one way or something. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not paying that much. But I don't. Know. Yeah, I just hope it recovers. Then it's not like, a, oh yeah, we're just putting the prices up, you know, just for a temporary time. But that could become this, you know, this new normal we all keep talking about. Mm. That's how it used to be back in the 90s and the early 2000s, you know, 400 bucks to Wellington when there was like no competition and stuff. Mm. Yeah, let's not go back there. No thanks. Mm. Do, you, do your guys, do they prefer working like in a, in a standalone house as opposed to the challenges of working in apartments? Because like, I'd imagine apartments can be quite difficult to, to work in given that there's like confined spaces and you know, um, rooms right next to each other and that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, oh, look, I think all day long someone would work in a in a house than an apartment or mm. even a commercial building where it's a different like occupant on the floor below mm. because you can't just go downstairs 
at lunchtime and say, hey, I'm just going to lift your, your access hatches and mm. you know, run waste pipe. Or So, yeah, like, like that's a big part of all of our fit-out stuff is unless it's a, got a pump on it, you've got to get into the tenancy below. Mm. And, like, you know, there's some, some people, there's some places, like, I don't know, I won't name them, but have very high high security it's just out of, off, out of the question you're not coming onto our floor for any given mm. reason in case we're an Israeli spy or something yeah. you know and, <laughs> <laughs> and so so yeah, look and it's hard and you know I think a lot of people that try to price that sort of work that haven't done it before come mm. unstuck because they'll price a, one of these commercial jobs like a like a house almost and they might go hey this is a three trip visit mm. to do but realistically it's a six trip job yeah because you got to get down to the floor below between 4 a.m and 7 a.m or you got to do it on the saturday or you know what i mean so yeah. it's definitely tougher on the staff mm. you know oh the, the challenges around say like a when you have to you know shut the water off in a particular high-rise building in, in the cbd um that you, you know very well um, you know, and it's done at a certain time of the day to limit disruption but then it's like you say it's, it's harder on the staff because they have to work you know, sometimes bloody two three four o'clock in the morning just to avoid you know avoid um you know the the disruption of shutting the water down mm. um, in a building and we've had that you know fairly recently down in the city there um do, do the guys sort of do they all have to draw short straws for those jobs or is it just whoever's on yeah look Look, I'm really, we're really lucky mm. uh, or blessed. You know, I'm not a religious guy, but it's a good way to describe it. It's just the culture of the team, you know. Like, mm. we use Microsoft Teams, and, you know, Sinead will go, oh, hey, guys, can someone give us a hand this night? And quite often, you know, they're fighting over it. Mm. You know, look, you know, they do get paid, you know, different rates for working that night time. Yeah. And, and look, I'm stoked that we can pay them that because it, it mm. does definitely impact on their on their lifestyle and look different people can do it at different times you know like if you've got a young family you know you're not really geared up to do that sort of stuff mm. whereas when if you're in your mid-20s or you know you've got no other half you can do that stuff you yeah, know okay. all week long you know mm. I sort of joke at times we should actually have a roster for having a guy that just works night times for the week <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, we'll and, go there. and then get yeah. someone else and yeah. so yeah look it, it, it's hard like sometimes the apartment mm. side's actually quite good because the apartment downtime is actually say 9 a.m to 3 p.m when everyone's mm. at work yeah that's right you know so that side of it's actually quite cool because you can do a shutdown at nine and as long as you've got the water back on but say some of these other commercial buildings where they actually occupy nine till five mm. that's when you start at 10 and yeah and sometimes you know quite often on most jobs there's like a point of no return it's like you all right we're gonna cut this pipe out and once that's done it's on you know and mm. i remember one time in one of the buildings we did that and um yeah, one of the guys had, had a brain fart and he grabbed like four empty bottles of, of acetylene and oxy. And so, so we, we cut everything out. It's like midnight. It's like, oh, you're kidding me. But four yeah. empty bottles. Yeah, well, just two, two, two of each. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you always grab one plus a sphere, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, no, it was pretty good. High pool was open 24 hours. So we shot <laughs> down there yeah. and got the job done. So, but yeah, look, all the guys are awesome, you know, like. You could call almost any guy at two o'clock in the morning and say, "Hey, I'm in the shit," and, mm. and they jump in their van and come help. So, mm, mm. and oh, I, I don't know what actually creates that, but mm. I think it's just the way they're treated. You know, yeah. not just by me or or the the office team, but the way they treat each other. You know, and generally, if you treat people well, well, that comes down to that culture thing, like you were saying before. And um, yeah, I mean, like say plumbers across different companies across the city they'll all be doing the same job at some point you know they're all going to fix a plumbing issue the guys that work for you obviously you know they're, they're putting their hands up to do work because you, you treat them well whereas you know there might be a, another company down the road where they get treated like shit and they're like no i'm not going to do that at midnight for for this jerk or whatever mm. so it all comes down to company culture and your values and stuff and you know i think you guys have got that that awesome story to tell like all of your you know your as people come into your um into your business you know you, you've got this this like legacy to lean on it's almost like you know the all blacks and stuff where, where you've got a, a big background story <laughs> not sure if that's a good thing to <laughs> um, it's almost like the all blacks of about you know, 10 years ago yeah um but yeah i mean that's that, that can like that can make people like um you know quite proud to to represent a company yeah and, and look i i haven't actually asked the guys but i reckon like looking at that skyline at the night time when it's lit up and whatnot 
I think a lot of the guys would be stoked that, mm. that they're partly responsible for for making sure they're successful all the time and um, mm. and that whole legacy thing I think is important but I think it's probably a legacy with also how they're still treated you know mm. like you know I'd, I'd still drive around in the van if I can I've got this van fetish mm. um, but yeah not conducive for taking two kids and a wife <laughs> <laughs> in, in a, in a, in a three seater vehicle so <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think it's just that we're all low key, and you know, mm. I don't think anything's ever got to anyone's head. And you know, I think just the way we treat people, I think that that's the secret. Mm. What, what do you think is some of the like the, the challenges of your industry? Like, is there is there anything about plumbing, or, you know, trades that that kind of pisses you off? Like, is there anything you go, like, I wish we could do something about that to change that, or mm. you know, are there, are there things that just bug you? Um, I guess like finding staff is mm. next next to impossible that's why we we train heaps you know i think we've got about 25 apprentices at the moment and mm. and we don't specifically you know look to fill a quota mm-hmm. you know like we actually quite often just advertise for the sake of of basically like putting your rod in the water you know mm-hmm. you might mm-hmm. catch a, a good fish like um and yeah some some of our best guys come to us through the weirdest places like mm. One guy who's been with us for a few years now, he sort of passed his accountancy degree and then became like editor of a magazine. And and then he thought, oh, you know, just throw my hand at plumbing. But he's just so, I think the whole maybe deadline stuff and, you know, attention to detail, he's, he's just a weapon at the paperwork side of things as well. You know, mm. we've just recently taken on a guy who jumps over the sides of cliffs and, and drills holes in them to stabilise them, you know. Wicked, yeah. I think he, he's going to be pretty good, I reckon. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's probably the biggest bug there is trying to find people and, you know, with that old brain drain, mm. you know, comes wage pressure and stuff like that. And, mm. and then, you know, you don't know what, you know, people go, oh, this guy's getting X, Y, Z an hour, you know, but, you know, one guy... Um, left about six months ago and I said oh, I'll see you in six months you know he bought a shit and yeah, he called up in four you know <laughs> right. and right. so the yeah. whole thing around the whole grass being greener elsewhere and generally if you hear things about high pay rates they're, they're unsustainable you know like mm. you, know, you, you know you've run a business yep. you know I've run a business you know hey I'd love to give every single person ten dollars an hour more but mm. it'll be great for the three months until we're out of business yeah you know what I mean uh, we've had a couple of instances of that where someone's gone thinking that the grass is greener, but then they've gone over you know, to the other side and it's like, oh, it's only casual work and I'm not getting the guaranteed hours per week. So then, you know, therefore they're not getting paid as much. So, you know, you might pay them a, a say a little bit less or whatever, but then, you know, they've got guaranteed work, guaranteed hours and stuff. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been interesting from, from that point of view to see how people are reacting to this, this jumping around like economy and stuff. What do you what do you think makes a good plumber? Like, what are what are some key traits that you guys look for when you actually when you hire someone? Yeah, um, we are quite specific. Like, like, if you looked at one of our ads, um, you know, we say if you're jumping ship for a dollar now, this probably isn't the right place for you. Mm. Um, we've got a don't employ dicks policy on our awesome. yeah. on our ad, mm-hmm. and um, and then we look for for special things. I don't really look at their schooling too much. I don't look at their age too much. Mm. I, I look at what their hobbies are. Like if you came to me and you said, I like hanging out with my girlfriend and playing PlayStation all weekend. See you, you later. You wouldn't be getting an interview <laughs> with me. Um, but you know, we've had guys that have been right into motocross, um, rugby players. Um, yeah, just people that have a passion, generally. Mm. If you've got mm. a passion for something, you know, or you played high level something, you generally have that little grit and determination to get on and do the job mm. and you don't like to half-ass things yeah and so i think that's probably that's our main secret yeah so that's cool like it's um similar to when we when we hire staff like we always say in our ads we don't hire qualifications because you can you can go to uni and get qualified up the wazoo but you know if you're a bit of a bit of a drop kick at the end of the mm. day and you've just got no personality or no ability to, to deal with or interact with people because that's quite a big thing in our industry. Like, as much as we we building in facility managers, we're actually it's the interaction with people that's the key. Mm. And if you can't like have a conversation with someone, or you know, get your point across, or solve a problem for someone, then yeah, you're not much good um, in that regard. You can't just be a you know a computer based 
mm. building manager or facility manager, you've got to be out and about you know, with people at the end of the day. Yeah, and you've got to, yeah, it's all about the people, right? Mm. Like, you know, we, I think we say in the ad, you know, we can teach you to be a good plumber, but we can't mm. stop you from being the dickhead. Yeah. You know, <laughs> awesome. it might not be those words exactly, yeah. but that's, what, that's yeah. what we're insinuating. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So, yeah, that's the main thing you get. If you surround yourself with good people, good things happen. Mm. You know, mm. and, and these are all the little things that you've learnt over 20 years that you sort of doubt yourself, oh, should I be kicking off about this? Should I be ripping into someone about that? But mm. then you listen, listen to other podcasts and stuff, and you're like, oh, shit, I do that, or mm. I do that, I mm. do that. Yeah. And do you actually have, a, like, a network or, or a business sort of mentor that you go to? Yep. Yeah, we've got one guy, um, Alistair. He used to be CEO of Plumbing World oh, yeah. uh, oh, 20 years ago, maybe. But yeah, he's, he's just a real good sounding board. Mm. And quite often he makes us actually find the answers ourselves. Yeah. And but what I quite like about him is he, he just knows the numbers and, you know, where, you know, a certain overhead should, sent, should sit percentage-wise. And if you're mm. within this tolerance, you're doing well. And, you know, mm. and, and look, he's, he's a real gentleman and he works with a number of people in the industry, I think. And, and he never, ever talks about other companies by name or mm. anything like that. And... So you sort of feel like you're in quite safe hands as well. Yeah, that's you know? good. Yeah, what you said before about um, about finding the answers, that I th- most of these business coaches, that's what they that's what they do. They kind of they don't have the answers, but they'll just keep prodding and poking and, and like you know just um, encouraging the answer out of because you we don't think it, but we've actually got the answers. We know what the what the mm. solutions are, but sometimes it's nice to have someone else you know kind of drag it out of you. Um, yeah, so that, that must become you know quite um, useful, especially being in a family business where you there might sort of be a little bit more, you know, insular. You need some sometimes you need that external um, opinion. A referee, basically, mm. at times, because <laughs> eh? you know, yeah, y- you're all convinced that you're individually right, and you mm. need someone else to go, hey, well, actually, you know, Rowan's right most of mm. the time, um, <laughs> you know, because X, Y, Z. But mm. you know, like say with just me and Angus being polar opposites. Yeah, Alistair's real awesome. He'll go, I agree with Rowan, I agree with Angus, or yeah. you shouldn't go above this percentage, or you know, we need to pull finger out here. Or, mm. So it is good to have that that outside. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, I don't think we'd ever have a board or anything because I just don't mm. listen to people. You know, like. But it also makes takes bloody ages to make decisions when you've got a board. Yeah. Oh, mm. even even having mum and dad in the business, you know, decisions took longer just because mm. there was four people. You know, mm. me and Angus can go. Blah 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 blah. Okay, mm. let's do it. Or blah 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 blah. No, mm. you know. So I think it's it's you know, you can have a, a decent sized business, but you don't need politics, you know, to mm. stop you from making decisions. Just follow your gut. Yeah. You know, it generally works pretty well. Yeah, for sure. Eh? Your your gut instinct. <laughs> um, so you probably touched on a lot of these things already during the conversation. But like, what do you um what do you enjoy about the the industry? Not maybe not so much just your company. Because you know, it sounds like you've got a great culture going on, all that sort of thing. But what do you enjoy about the, the plumbing industry as a as a whole? I think we've all got the same problems, and you know, being plumbers, we're probably the most well-rounded, grounded individuals of all trades. Yeah. Um, you know, we get we, you know, I'm part of the master plumber um, fraternity, you know, mm. and every year we have a, a master plumber conference, and they have awesome speakers and. Um, but you're just the networking, you know. You go, oh shit, I've got that problem, or, or this is happening, or mm. or what they, you know, what the master plumbers are good at, just the whole contractual side of stuff, the health and safety stuff, the advocacy stuff, mm. you know. So, like, I think it's eleven hundred bucks a year or something. Like, yeah. it's it's pretty cool. Like, yeah, it's good value that way. Like, you know, one contract that goes south, mm. you know, you spend that ten, you know, ten times over, mm. you mm. know, and that's not necessarily just. A bigger company like a one-man band probably needs it needs it more than anyone else you know mm. you know someone that you know just come off the tools and wants to get started and and oh here here's a contract or here's your health and safety you know here's some savings for mobile or mm. your know, health and safety stores higher pool blah 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 you yeah. know like you just can't buy that sort of stuff so mm-hmm. well, you can for 100 bucks but um <laughs> yeah and, and then yeah just people are you know, it's just the people, you know, mm. just good people. Just want to have a beer at the end of the day, and you know, yeah, just just good people. Yeah, yeah. From a like from a technology point of view, like plumbing hasn't really changed throughout the ages, has it? It's always been about sort of moving water or yeah. waste or you know to a, a particular point. Like, um, 
Is there any sort of like interesting developments or technology coming up in, in the in the plumbing space? Mm. We used to say shit goes downhill, but now with the advent of pumps, it can actually go up away. So, so you some smart ass electrician or a builder that tells me that. When, yeah. Um, but yeah, look, everything's constantly evolving, and I think stuff is becoming more niche. You know, it might be a, a septic type system, or it could be pumps, or it could be, you know, roofing, or or like even just the types of water pipe you've got these days. Like there must be. 50 on the market mm, I reckon mm. and so that's probably got its good points and bad points um, but look it's always evolving but I guess the fundamentals are the same you know there's things around water saving mm. you know I think that's going to bite everyone in the bum you know like say a toilet you know back when we were kids would be a 9 litre flush sort of you know halfway up the wall and mm. if you didn't stand up before you flushed it you're in, <laughs> in certain uh, <laughs> It became a, like one of those B-Day things at the yeah, same time. Yeah, yeah, well, you yeah. just get sucked down the whole thing if you're <laughs> under five. And um, whereas now everyone's going, oh, we're just going to have a, a, a three-litre full flush. Mm. It's just like that, that doesn't even push the toilet paper away. Mm. So even if it does flush the toilet, because the, the gradients of the drains, you know, are used to more water, they get blocked. And so mm. then stuff blocks up and up and up. And it's happened on, you know, two or three buildings I can think of just already we've put new toilets in and 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 these are buildings from the 60s or 70s mm. and all of a sudden the you know the the drains are starting to block up and mm-hmm. they're like well what's going on it's like well you've got these toilets that are doing a four and a half liter full flush compared to nine mm. you know some people literally use a whole roll of toilet paper <laughs> and just chuck it down there <laughs> and um yeah so i think that could you know it's great being green and more for mm-hmm. that but also got to be practical at times as well well that, that sort of stuff's still happening too because we were found in a newish building uh that shall remain nameless like we were saying before that yeah exactly that the the, the flush isn't washing the the paper away and then it just the water sort of cruises off and the paper just gets stuck in the pipe dries out someone might go away for a bit it really turns like concrete then the next one comes in just keeps backing up and building up and mm. again, the gradient on the pipes isn't isn't steep enough and all that so yeah, yeah. So they might have to end up changing the plumbing code to have more gradient so so less water will make it flush better you know mm. so yeah i guess nothing changes but but there's always development you know mm. there's always something easier you know just gotta look at the power tool market you know there's mm. something you know i think tool for every job makita yeah. makes coffee machines now so oh, really? you know <laughs> and so yeah sure so uh, yeah i think nothing changes but mm. it's constantly evolving yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And so, you know, things are going Bluetooth now, so you can check on water consumption from your phone, or mm. you, know, you can flush toilets remotely, or you know, that's probably one area it's heading in. Whether mm. it's just a gimmick or not, I don't know. It's that um, they call it the Internet of Things, where everything's connected by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever, and you can do everything from your phone. It's quite handy, with, like being able to flush your toilet if you forget hey, if you. <laughs> if, you, if you forget to flush the toilet you're like crikey get the phone out and flush that yeah well that's cool man like it's been good to have a chat and um um you know it's uh you know this, the, your, your story is a bloody good one i find it really interesting and the, the family business thing is um you know is, is key to that um yeah you know, the, well i know the you know our team over the years has enjoyed working with you guys and um actually the first time i came across you was out in um <coughs> we used to manage a place out in botany downs called new haven yeah right and I think you guys did the the plumbing installation out there with um, McCrenny Construction. For a big chunk of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I remember the, the plumber out there was an absolute legend, but I can't remember his name. It might have been Bruce. No, that's not Bruce this year. That was his dad's name. Um, but yeah, there was the, just the guy I remember and remember his face to this day. And he was just a really good bugger. And you know, I guess that's um, that's all part of you guys' culture as well. And you know, having good staff and treating them well. Mm. Um, but yeah, like certainly from an active point of view, we you know we enjoy working with you and hopefully work with you a bit more over the over the coming years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, look forward to it. Yeah, cool man. Awesome. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me. No worries. Mm.